Hi, I'm Chris Moore with HVAC Pro Blog, and this week I'm really excited to share a video that I recorded for my Patreon members one year ago. This one is the five residential codes that you need to know for heat pumps. Some are greatly enforced wherever you're working, and some are going to be a surprise. We're going to cover requirements for sizing and selection, condensate overflow shutoffs, ductless traps, yes, you heard that right, locking caps and supplemental heat lockout controls. Without further ado, here's the training. The first code I wanna talk about is in section 1401 of the International Residential Code, and this one dates all the way back to at least 2009, that's where my code book stopped. Um, and it's about equipment and appliance sizing. So I'm not a big fan of reading slides, but when it comes to code, I wanna make sure I get this across the right way and then we'll talk about applying it. So for number one, or I should say 1A, heating and cooling equipment shall be sized in accordance with ACA Manual S or other approved methodologies based on building loads calculated in accordance with ACA Manual J or other approved heating and cooling calculation methodologies. So I'm gonna tell you right now, locally, there's nothing else approved residentially than Manual J and Manual S. So uh, you're gonna to have to find software most likely in order to do Manual J. You can't do this by longhand. Uh, you're gonna most likely run across software that is correct, ACA Manual J approved, powered by ACA Manual J software that you see that logo in the middle here. And it's Manual J version eight. If it's based on Manual J and it doesn't have this seal, that means it's missing pieces. Okay, so the best way to know that your software is approved is to go to the ACA, ACCA.org website, go to standards and click on approved software. And there'll be links to each of these different ones that are approved on here. And now personally, I like to use WriteSoft. I've used it for about 15, maybe 20 years. Uh, but all of the other ones give you the same number. It's just a preference of do you like to create a floor plan and see the rooms. That's what WriteSoft does. They actually have a floor plan piece where you draw out the rooms. I'm more of an AutoCAD kind of guy. Or do you like the worksheet style where you're just gonna list the wall, list the window and the door on the wall, which way it faces and move on, all right? So there's a couple different methods here. AdTech and Elite are very good at the uh, worksheet style. Carmel software, it, it's app based on an iPad. It does a great job for block loads. It's really hard to use. Uh, you have to almost have to do it twice to get back to room by room, but it is possible. I've done it on, on my own house. Um, cool Calc is actually free. It's a, uh, you, if you go to coolcalc.com, you can sign up and do block loads and there's no cost. Only when you want to download and print off the reports is there a charge and you pay per bundle of, of reports. Um, Avenir is not one I've personally used. It's a 3D modeling software. It goes great for those that are 3D modeling homes and in AutoCAD, uh, it's a great possibility. I personally haven't used it so I can't give you any feedback on it but all of these on this screen are approved and meets the code requirement in the 2021 International Residential Code. So let's talk about 1B. So that was 1A, the requirement to uh, size your system correctly, right? Now we're talking about equipment selection. So in that piece, there was a note that said, he including equipment shall be sized in accordance with ACA Manual S. <clears throat> that means re-rating the systems at your design conditions to show that it actually meets the load requirement. All right. Now there's many different ways to do this, but what I want to point out is there are exceptions in the code. And one of the codes uh, exceptions in the IRC uh, dating all the way back is the exception for variable refrigerant flow technology, right? So the specified equipment or appliance utilizes multi-stage or variable refrigerant flow technology and the loads that are calculated in accordance with the approved heating and cooling calculation methodology are within the range of the manufacturer's published capacities for that equipment appliance. It doesn't mean you can just put it whatever you want in. I want to make sure that's clear but it does mean it doesn't necessarily have to meet manual S or you have to walk through the manual S process if the submittal, the published data, shows that your load is within the operating range, okay? So I happen to know Mitsubishi very well. Mitsubishi for manual S uses their software called Diamond System Builder. And every manufacturer has something. If you work with um, American Standard, if you go to AS DealerNet, there's a great uh, equipment selection uh, tool that gives you the same information, right? So you type in your load calculation design conditions, it spits out with line set lengths and everything, what your actual heating and cooling outputs are. That's manual S. But if you have the submittal 
for that same system, as you can see here on the right, we can prove that this system has an operating range that will meet the load requirement just with the submittal. So of course, you definitely want to run this through your building inspector first. Don't just show this. This is not going to be your saving grace because you do have the ability of using a tool. But if you're using a manufacturer that doesn't have a tool, I highly recommend you start with a submittal and see if that'll fly. All right. So that's the exception in the code. That's why we're, got, we're calling this 1B. We broke out the uh, equipment uh, sizing from the equipment selection. So two very important pieces. Once this is installed, it's really hard to change the size of the system. It's really important that these two pieces are done first before the installation for obvious reasons, okay? So let's move on to number two. Number two, residential code number two that you need to know about heat pumps is about auxiliary and secondary drain pan systems. In the code, in the IRC, and this dates all the way back as well, this is nothing new, what they state is you have to have one of the four following methods all right, the first one doesn't apply to, um, let's say, ductless heat pumps, right? But you need to have an auxiliary drain pan with a separate drain. That's great for ducted heat pumps, especially when it's over conditioned space, like in an attic. Or you need to have a separate overflow drain line, all right? You could pipe that off the unit if you can't get a drain pan in. An auxiliary drain pan without a separate drain line needs to be equipped with a water level device. So you'll notice all three of these are talking about overflow drains or secondary drain pans with ways to shut the system off. The only one that would apply to a ductless system if you're doing a heat pump would be a water level detection device conforming to UL 508, all right? And this would go right into the evaporator pan. So it looks like this. And there's a bunch of different versions out there. You know, AquaGuard makes one, uh, Rector Seal makes some. They basically go, they're small and they tie in and break either the communication line or they tie in directly to the water detection terminals on the control boards. They attach and the sensors monitor water level height and they typically go tight to the right hand side on a wall mount where the electrical sections are on almost every manufacturer, okay? So this is what meets that residential code in the IRC. Uh, don't be surprised if uh, this starts becoming enforced. Think about it, if that drain clogs, that water is now gonna go right into the conditioned space, all over the drywall, maybe cause the units to, to fall if you don't have that secured to wood stud. Really important, you plan for these accessories. These are not factory installed. Any manufacturer residential in the United States that I know of don't put this in the overflow pans yet. I would probably expect this to happen eventually. It's a, it's a code requirement and it's being enforced because manufacturers can make money, right? Why are they just gonna let the accessories take it? So uh, really important, you know, residential code number two, put those overflow switches in those pans on those ductless units. All right, number three, if you didn't know, because you're not supposed to have a trap on a ductless mini split system, there is a way to address this in the code. So section 307 of the International Mechanical Code says, ductless mini split equipment that produces condensate shall be provided with an inline check valve located in the drain line or a trap, which you're not supposed to have a trap in these, right? So the way this looks is there's a device like this. This one's made by Easy Trap. It goes in the line vertically. So after you typically run your drain line outside on the vertical to, to drain your condensate, you would actually tie this in before you tie in your flexible drain hose. That's what's usually done, it doesn't have to be flexible. By the way, uh, any drain line for a system that is less than 20 tons needs to be at least three quarter inch. This is another piece that a lot of people miss because it's really easy to put the right size uh, hose on that just happens to connect. So really important, residential code number three, easy traps, they're dry traps, right? They go in and it's gonna stop any sort of insects or smell or anything else coming in from outside. It's very rarely enforced. It stinks to install after the fact, Trust me, I've done it with personal experience, but doesn't mean I should have omitted it. Make sure you include it, it's really low cost, particularly if it goes in during installation. All right, let's go right to code number four. Locking access port caps, everybody's favorite. In the IRC, especially the 2021, which is the most recent, it's gonna be uh, promulgated here in Massachusetts, not too long, but this was in codes dating all the way back, right? Refrigerant circuit access ports located outdoors shall be fitted with a locking type tamper resistant cap or shall be otherwise secured to prevent unauthorized access. So that would be like, it's gated and locked around the condensers. A lot of these codes are written for a reason. I mean, obviously everybody knows and everybody hears the old wives tales about people huffing refrigerant, dying. We have to use these caps. I know it sounds 
sounds crazy and it's a pain in the butt for technicians. I've personally been there where you show up at a site, you can't find your wrench, um, you can't find the Allen wrench or whatever you need to get the cap off. Super frustrating, I get it, but it's there to save lives because there are people out there, there are kids out there that don't know. And there's two major manufacturers of these, right? There's the Rector Seal version where you have the piece that you push in with a key and they make this in a, a screwdriver style, not just the key that goes on your rings. Um, and then there's also the Diversitech version where you tighten down an Allen wrench to make sure that those caps can't come off, right? They just spin on the other side. Really important, use these caps. They go in during installation. It's gonna be an inspection requirement in a lot of towns, particularly here in Massachusetts. Uh, words getting around, they are, they are enforcing this. Make sure you guys are using them. It's an accessory. Manufacturers do not ship with their equipment with these caps yet, right? Like I said, don't be surprised. It's really important to that equipment meets code and make it simple and easy for their installers, the people buying their equipment. So I wouldn't be surprised to see this on the next generation. All right, wrapping this up is residential code number five. And this addresses heat pump supplementary heat. So typically you see this on ducted heat pumps. And the way the code in the IECC, the International Energy Conservation Code, the way it reads is that heat pumps having supplemental electric resistance heat shall have controls that, except for during defrost, prevent supplemental heat operation when a heat pump compressor can meet the heating load. This is really important during setback and different, different situations because manufacturers' algorithms and most heat pumps will kick on supplemental heat if you have a temperature difference, a big temperature difference. So if you set your heat pump back at night a few degrees and you turn it on in the morning, it could be 60 out or 50 degrees out and it would kick on those supplemental toasters. So there's a code requirement in the IECC that says you have to have a way of locking those out. It could be built into the algorithm, I doubt it. Most likely you're gonna use a third party control to lock it out based on outdoor temperature, all right? And the temperature you need to lock it out at is when the heat pump can no longer meet the heating needs of the home, not a magic temperature that I choose or a utility told me or anything like that, all right? And the way you do this is heat loss is lineal. So if I do a heat loss, in this example, it came out to 80,000 BTUs at five degrees. Eventually, I know that that heat pump can't meet the total heat loss if I don't install you know, the right size, let's say, if it doesn't meet manual S requirements, okay? So in this example, it's lineal, so I stop heating the house at 65 degrees, that's when I need zero BTUs. And I know I need 80 at five degrees, so I draw a lineal line, it's really simple. Then I plot the actual heat pump heat output. This is really easy when you're using a cold climate heat pump because most of those get 100% capacity at least down to five. So if your design conditions are five or more, you know you're gonna get 100% capacity out of that. It comes right off of the, the max heating capacity right off the submittal for these heat pumps. So I'm gonna plot a straight line all the way across. At, in this example, this heat pump was giving me about 58,000 BTUs right around, let's say 24 degrees, I need to turn on supplemental heat. So I'm gonna lock out supplemental heat if it's above 24 degrees in this example. That's what meets the code. And of course, supplemental or emergency heat is sized for the difference or all of it, right? So supplemental would be the difference of what you need, what the heat pump cannot keep up. Emergency heat would be sized for the total, the 80,000 BTUs in this example, that black line. Um, if you're only sizing for supplemental, it looks like you would need about 22,000 BTUs. So that's how that code piece breaks down. In order to do that, it's based on outdoor temperature and you would lock out supplemental heat if the heat pump can meet the heat loss of the home. So what did you think? Were there any surprises when it comes to the five heat pump code requirements that you should know? I'd love to see your comments below. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe and share it with somebody. If you found value in this video and you wanna get them one year in advance, head over to my Patreon page where you can join for as little as $8 a month. Thanks again for joining me this week at HVAC Pro Blog, where we provide advice for residential system design, quality installation, and system diagnosis. I'll see you soon.